artificial selection experiments have also shown that humans can select for different phenotypes, such as high and low oil content, as Woodruff et al. have found this uh, baseline. And over 50 generations, they selected for oil content well outside of the original bounds of the population. Um, and there's also nice examples of flowering time shifting after a drought done by Steve Frank and colleagues um, in this brassica species. So the classic sort of population genetic approach to looking at contemporary evolution is to look at allele frequency changes through time. And this goes back to Ford and Fisher when they were looking at a scarlet tiger moth uh, color morph allele, this Pedro Negro allele, which they witnessed decreasing uh, through the generations. And they were curious if this was consistent with a pattern of neutral evolution or whether this a particular color morph is being selected against. And to sort of, I'm going to be discussing throughout the talk these allele frequency changes, so just a quick refresher. Um, what I'm talking about here are uh, the differences in uh, a generation of allele frequency and the preceding generation. So they witnessed many allele frequency changes over the course of um, seven years, and they were curious if these allele frequency changes, as I said earlier, were consistent with neutral evolution or drift. And they sort of used Wright's technology against him here. And they were able to reject the hypothesis of neutral evolution based on allele frequency change variants being more extreme than would be expected under a model of drift alone. And they did this by estimating effective population size through market recapture studies, which as we know has many limitations. So it's interesting to note that modern genomic approaches really haven't changed that much since these earlier studies. So this is really nice work done by Molly Burke where they selected uh, these lines of Drosophila for early development time. Um, and they saw genome-wide patterns of allelic differentiation consisting with selection on standing variation. Um, and Alan Bertland and colleagues have seen these patterns of fluctuating selection over spring, fall, season pairs over three years in Drosophila. Um, but there's kind of a key limitation, or two limitations, of these types of approaches. First, these approaches, um, as pointed out in this really nice paper by James Baldwin Brown, are relatively underpowered to detect selected loci. And the underlying cause here is multiple testing really bites you here. You're testing for selection genome-wide across all polymorphic loci. And that requires that you surpass a significance level that's extremely high. So you're only rejecting neutrality in the cases when you see really large allele frequency changes. And as we know, many beautiful adaptations that occur over short time scales are fundamentally polygenic in nature. And as the basis of these adaptations are very subtle allele frequency shifts through time, these are imperceptible in these types of tests. So the work that Graham and I are doing sort of looks at a different approach. Um, whereas this previous approach is to find the loci with allele frequency changes that are too extreme to be uh, something that are, that are caused by neutrality alone, uh, what we're asking is, are genome-wide allele frequency changes consistent with a model of heritable variation and fitness, or are they more consistent with a model of neutrality? And we're using sort of a different signal here. The, something sort of special happens when there's heritable variation for fitness in a population. So what happens is the dynamics of a neutral allele through time are affected by this uh, heritable variation for fitness in the population that just doesn't happen under neutrality alone. So through the remaining part of the talk, I'm going to sort of develop some intuition about how we can see these special dynamics through variances and covariances of this neutral data. So just to sort of build some intuition into what this looks like, you can imagine an orange neutral allele here on a beneficial um, uh, blue background. And you see that because this neutral allele is, is on this beneficial background, it's increasing in frequency through the generations. However, segregation and recombination are actively working to disassociate this neutral allele from this particular beneficial background. And it's interesting to note that had this neutral allele been on a, on a disadvantageous background, we can sort of see a similar pattern. And because a neutral allele is no more likely to be found on a beneficial background or a disadvantageous background, like drift, the expected value of allele frequency change is zero. But unlike drift, this variance is greater than what we expect. However, more importantly, there's a covariance between allele frequency changes across two generations. So if a neutral allele finds itself on a beneficial background across these two time points, and it's increasing on this beneficial background, it will also tend to increase in this later generation, S. The reason is, is that there are fitness associations that are maintained from generations T to X that haven't been broken down by recombination at this point. And this induces this positive covariance, which as I said, doesn't happen under the case when there's no heritable variation for fitness. So what's really special about this is the nature of this covariance and the variances as well depends on the recombination rate in the region. And this is an important signal, so it sort of develops some more intuition about how this works. 
Um, we have, in this case, a, a neutral allele on a lower combination background that's also in a high thickness background. And you can see that it's this neutral allele slung shot in frequency um, as it's not being actively disassociated off this background. However, had this neutral allele found itself on a low, sorry, on a high recombination background, uh, this effect is dampened. The trajectory is dampened through time as recombination is disassociating this neutral allele off of this uh, high fitness background. So to sort of step through the basics of our theoretical model, um, I'm going to discuss how we're going to sort of model these covariances by looking at each component through time. Um, so it's important to note that there are other stochastic processes that affect allele frequency change through time. Um, Non-heritable variation in fitness and Mendelian segregation add noise to this process, but these don't create the, the covariance I'm talking about. They don't contribute to this covariance. So I'm not going to really talk about these. It turns out that the only uh, effect uh, on covariances is heritable variation in fitness. And we can think about this as the allele frequency change in the population is just the allele frequency changes across all individuals. And each individual, uh, I, has an allele frequency, xi, and a fitness, fi. And you can see that if there's no heritable variation for fitness, all of these fi's are one, and this term collapses to zero. There's no change in allele frequency due to heritable differences in fitness. So I'm going to step through this sort of like very simple single locus model. I think this gives lots of intuition for the genetic basis of this type of approach. Um, so as this was on the previous slide, now we're imagining that this neutral allele is on a fitness background, here colored in red, that's on the same haplotype. And then in this individual, there's also homologous gamete. Um, and, and at this locus, this uh, blue allele is contributing to fitness as well. And so it turns out that this equation, if we have the single locus model, becomes a statement about the effect size, alpha subscript L, and a statement about linkage disequilibrium. And this D prime term here is the common notion of linkage disequilibrium, which gets at the, the fact that the neutral allele is on the same haplotype as the selected allele. And then this D double prime linkage disequilibrium is a bit uh, less familiar. But what this is getting at are the chance associations of the neutral allele and another gamete sampled from the population that contributes to fitness. So the covariances, as I mentioned, occur when some fitness associations uh, in generation T are maintained until generation S. So using that simple single locus genetic model, we can now think about how these covariances, essentially, sorry, how these linkage equilibrium statements are decreasing through time. So in the next generation, the progeny of these individuals can either um, have neutral alleles that remain on this red fitness background, in which case there's no recombination, which happens with probability 1 minus r. Or recombination can place this neutral allele on the homologous gametes fitness background with probability r. And then th these associations, either the ones that are created in this generation or uh, the ones that are maintained and not recombining onto this other background, um, then contribute to this covariance if they're maintained all the way to generation S, which happens if there's no recombination uh, with probability 1 minus r until generation S. So using these type of approaches, we develop a covariance between an allele frequency um, change at time t and at time s. And what this turns out to be is a statement that involves the initial additive genetic variation for fitness in the population, um, the initial associations, which get at these two LD terms, and the probability that uh, the initial LD is maintained with the neutral background, or the homologous gamete is recombined onto the other fitness background. Or, oh, sorry, too far. Um, and then the maintenance of these uh, associations through the generations until generation S. And then finally, as we know, additive genetic variation will decay. We're modeling this as a simple geometric decay um, at rate Z. Um, this is an oversimplification, but we're interested in sort of like you know, testing the, the, uh, the balance of this simple uh, approximation in the future. And uh, as I mentioned, this is a single locus model, and we're developing multi-locus models that use multiplicative fitness approaches um, and added effects, um, and these are in progress. Um, so just a quick recap before I move on to the next section. Um, there's covariance between allele frequency changes at different time points when there's heritable variation for fitness in the population. And this is a, a really potentially interesting signal in analyzing temporal data sets. And importantly, both variance and covariance of allele frequency change depend on the local recombination rate. So just as a cartoon illustration of what this could look like, if we have a chromosome here with recombination cold spots, here colored in blue, 
at least warmer spots in these uh, warmer colors here, we can form expectations for the variances and covariances of allele frequency change through time and how they differ across this recombination rate uh, heterogeneity. So to sort of show that I'm not making this all up, I've uh, done some Ford simulations using Kevin Thornton's Ford PP C++ library. Uh, the basic idea is that it's a model of Gaussian stabilizing selection. Uh, there's a 10 in generation Bergen, um, after which we have some optimum shifts of varying magnitude, a uh, tenth of a standard deviation away, a uh, half standard deviation away, and then a full standard deviation away. And then there are different regions of varying recombination rates from full linkage to completely unlinked. And so what we see is that these covariances, when there's, this is before the optimum shift, so essentially no directional selection, these covariances are flat, and they don't differ by recombination fraction, they're zero across the board. However, after the optimum shift, something special happens. And we see that in this case of a whole standard deviation optimum shift, a fairly large phenotypic shift, we see this covariance pop up in the lowest recombination region, and then it sort of goes and settles back down in these unlinked regions. But do note that the whole covariance is above zero in this case. This is a very strong signal. Um, with more subtle shifts, the pattern is, is less perceptible. Um, and we're interested in seeing like, you know, the sort of power to detect different shifts um, and that's future work that, that we'll be doing. So just a quick recap, uh, sorry, pardon me. Um, uh, current work in future directions, uh, we're developing a likelihood-based inference method. Um, and the idea here is that we're gonna look at each allele in, in the genome. Um, it has all these neighbors that can contribute to its fitness. They're varying recombination distances apart. Um, and we're gonna sort of look at one allele then move down to the next allele and fit a composite likelihood. Um, we're also developing covariance statements for models of fluctuating selection. So the idea here is that if a, if a neutral allele find, finds itself on a fitness background, maybe that fitness background is beneficial in one season, but not beneficial in another, and that would create negative covariance across dislike seasons. Um, and we're applying this to natural uh, population temporal and evolved and resequenced data sets currently. It's looking good, um, but I should say if you have temporal data, we would love to talk to you and potentially apply this to your data sets. Uh, so do find me, get in touch, I'll be here until the end of the conference. And with that, I'd like to thank my lab, Graham, and other folks. Thank you very much. So there's a few assumptions that we're making. One, we're looking at a, sort of a polygenic trait, right? So what's contributing to this are loci all across the genome. And what's really driving this decay is, is just linkage disequilibrium decaying through the generations. So it should be relatively robust to you know, the different uh, uh, sort of frequencies of these haplotypes. Yeah? I guess make them on the slide, the age of these polymorphisms is very fast, right? So if you have a, the old things are found Yes, that's a good question. So again, um, uh, the, the idea here is that it's a polygenic trait with you know, thousands of low side contributing this. So their allele frequencies are not shifting in a, in a very perceptible way. Happy to ask her, answer other questions later. Thank you.